recording. So hello everyone and welcome to our very last lecture where we are going to be learning new material. This is um, this is going to be our last chapter, chapter 25. And I don't have a PowerPoint for this one, so I'm going to do it from the book again. And it's probably the easiest chapter. Well, six was probably the easiest chapter in the book. This is uh, close to it. So table of contents, uh, oh, uh, 25, how do I? Okay, two categorical variables. And it is uh, the chi-square test, which we're gonna learn very, very straightforward. The problem with this test is that it's very mathematically intensive. Not tough mathematics, it's just, going to have um, a lot of steps. And luckily, our calculators can do it for us. Uh, and we're going to illustrate this with the following example. Where do young people live? <clears throat> so a sample survey asked a random sample of young adults, hey, where do you live? That is, where do you stay most often? OK. We have a total of 2,984 people who were asked this question. And you'll notice that we divided up all the people into two different categorical variables. We labeled the columns by age. We asked them 19 year olds, 20 year olds, 21 year olds, and 22 year olds. And we also got their living arrangements, which is our second categorical variable, parents' home, another person's home, your own place, group quarters, or some other, maybe they're homeless, I don't know. And this, these are the results that we get. So you'll notice a couple things. First of all, the numbers are all over the place. But we also have numbers in the margin. So for example, the 1357 in the top right, what does the 1357 refer to? The total amount of people who live in their parents' homes. Right, the 1357 is the total amount who live in their parents' home. Very, you know, pretty straightforward, I think. And what does the 540 in the bottom left refer to? The amount of people that are 19 years old. The amount of people in our sample that are 19 years old, right? Very, very straightforward, correct? Okay, so the, the, the margins, uh, the numbers in the margins are just totals. The question is as follows. Are these two categorical variables independent? In other words, should living arrangements and age be associated or not associated? One of the two things that we use the chi-squared test for, we're going to learn both of them in this chapter. What are the two things? The first one is testing independence. When we test independence, we are testing whether or not two categorical variables are related or not. So here's what we do. I'm going to give you just a straight up, here's what we do situation. You'll notice that the first entry is 324. This is... This number here, all these numbers are the observed numbers. These are what we actually have in our sample. Okay, these are the observed numbers. These are the ones that we actually have in our sample. What we wanna calculate are the expected numbers, what we expect to get in each one of those categories. And the way we calculate the expected value in each category, let's say I want this number here, I go to the number on the far right, the total for the row. I go for the total for the column. I multiply those and divide by the overall total. So when I take out my calculator and I do that, I get 1357 times 540 divided by 2984. When you do that on your calculator, what do you guys get? Assuming that you're doing it. What do you guys get, assuming that you're doing it? Anyone have a calculator? When you multiply the row total times the column total and you divide by the total total, what number do you get? Does anyone have a calculator doing it? It's just multiply and then divide. 245.56. All right. We get. 
uh, I get 0.57, but close enough. Oh, rounding, yeah. 245.57, yeah. right? So what we need to do is do the same thing for every one of the cells. So for example, if I'm looking for the expected one for 378, what would I multiply? What would I, what, what, what's the math that I would do? I'm not actually gonna do it, but what is the math that I would do? Someone tell me, please. 1,357 times 766 divided by 2,984. Exactly, right? You go to the row total, which is still 1,357. You divide it by 766, which is the column total. We multiply those together. Then you divide by 2,984 and you have the answer. Now you got to do that for each single one, each of them. you will get how many expected numbers if you do it that way. How many expected numbers will you get? Uh, four? Not four, how many cells are there? There's four columns and five cells each, correct? So how many, there's 20. So there's 20 cells, there's 20 numbers that you have to compute. And then what we do is we calculate something called the chi-squared. And the chi-squared values as follows. The chi-squared, which has, a, it's kind of like an X looking thing. The chi-squared is equal to the sum. We are gonna add up every observed minus expected squared over its corresponding expected, okay? We're gonna do every observed minus expected, square that, and then divide by the expected. When we do that, what do we get? We get the sum of how many numbers? We get the sum of how many numbers? We are gonna add 20 numbers together. Observed minus expected squared over expected for the first entry observed minus expected squared over expected for the second entry, for the third entry, for the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, all the way to the 20th entry. When we are done with all of that, we then have our chi-squared value. The question is, what does that chi-squared value give us? So let's think about it for a second. If the two categorical variables were truly independent, then my observed value and my expected value would be very close to each other. So would I then expect a large chi-squared value or would I expect a small chi-squared value? If my observed and my expected are close, in other words, I get something in the vicinity of what I expect, do I expect a big chi-squared value or a small chi-squared value? Small. So, Small chi-squared values then correspond to um, not rejecting the null hypothesis that they are independent. And large chi-squared values correspond to rejecting the null hypothesis and saying that they, are in, uh, that they are not independent. The question then becomes how small is small? So for that, we have to go to a chi-squared table. So let me pause sharing for a second. And let me load up a uh, chi-squared table. Um, so chi-square uh, distribution table. Okay. And let's then start sharing again. And let's load up my chi-square distribution table. And we can really use any one of these that we want. Uh, let's just use this first one here. It's probably pretty valid. Okay, so what we have here is this chi-squared distribution table. Okay. And let's say like before, we're gonna use our standard 5%, um, our, our standard 5% cutoff. Okay, what that means is, is if the p-value is less than 5%, what do we do? What's our conclusion when the p-value is less than 5%? 
what's our standard conclusion if the p-value is less than 5%? Anyone? What have, we, what have we done this whole, the last few weeks? If the p-value is less than 5%, what do we conclude? Let me see, someone said something in chat. They said we reject the null hypothesis, right? If the p-value is less than 5%, we reject the null hypothesis. So how do we know what the p-value is? Well, let's go back to our example, uh, which is right here. Okay, so they're using this example. They're going through it. They're gonna they're gonna do this in another section. Um, so let's do it. Where would it be? It would be here. Okay, so here is here the chi-square statistic. Okay. So in our example, they did it all for us. These are the 19 year olds, right? They went through every single one of them and look right here. And that thing, what they did is they calculate the chi-squared value. Now, I think what we should do is certainly confirm that the first one is what we got or what they get and what we got are the same. So let's go back here and let's go ahead and do the first one. What is the... Uh, expected again for the first square. What do we get on our calculator? We got 245.57, correct? And what was the observed for the first square? Anyone, what's the observed? This is an easier question because they literally gave it to us. What's the observed for the first square? Anyone? Three twenty-four. So let's go ahead and calculate the observed minus the expected y two forty-five. That's what we calculated. We took thirteen fifty-seven, multiplied it by five hundred forty, which is the row and column that three twenty-four appears in, and then divided by twenty-nine eighty-four. I think I expected was uh, yes. No, I have it right here. 245.57, have it right here, right? 245.57. So uh, what does someone say? Oh, I hate this thing, it's so annoying. Um, I was just test. oh, I appreciate that. That was, that, was, that was good. So let's do the math. And then we get to divide by the expected. So we take the observed, which is 324, subtracted by 245, square that, and then divide by the expected of 245. And on my calculator, I get 25.05. And when I go ahead and I look at their first value in their chi-square statistic calculation, we see the first value is in fact 25.05. So I'm gonna trust that all of those are correct and their value is 193.57. Now, we just said that if the chi-squared value is small, then we would reject the null hypothesis. Sorry, we would not reject the null hypothesis. Uh, sorry, if the p-value is small, we always reject the null hypothesis, right? If the p-value is not small, we don't reject the null hypothesis. This is standard. The question is, is the chi-squared value far enough away from zero for me to have a small p-value and reject the null hypothesis? Well, let's take a look. Let's load up this. You'll notice that when I look at the chi-square distribution tables, like the t-values, I have degrees of freedom. So the first thing we must do is we must ascertain, if we go back to the original problem, we must ascertain how many degrees of freedom we have in this problem. So this is a new formula because it's a new type of situation. The number of degrees of freedom is equal to, and I'm just gonna do it with the formula and then I want you to tell me what you think it's equal to. R minus one times C, <clears throat> excuse me, R minus one times C minus one. What do you think 
the R and the C are referring to in the formula, R minus one times C minus one. Anyone have a guess what R and C are referring to? Someone wrote, no, expected and observed is O and, and E. We've already used those. Expected is, an, the, I mean, every, every, um, every cell has its observed value and its expected value. We are looking for now for the degrees of freedom for this problem. And the degrees of freedom we're told is equal to R minus one times C minus one. And the only question is, what the hell is R and C? So the answer is, R is the number of rows. Yeah, someone just wrote it. Row and column, exactly. R is the number of rows and C is the number of columns. So in our example, R is how much? How many rows of data are there? I, I can't. Four. Uh, one, two, three, four. I see oh, four my rows. No, not, not the total and not the title. Five. The data is parents home, another person's home, your own place, group, quarters, or others. There's five rows. So five minus one is four. And how many columns of data are there? I have uh, four. four. Okay, four. So five minus one times four minus one, four times three. This particular problem has 12 degrees of freedom. So if we go back to the chi-square distribution thing, it'll probably say somewhere in the problem, hey, there's 12 degrees of freedom here. That's the wrong one. This is this one here. It'll probably say, hey, there's 12 degrees of freedom. And does it? Do you see anywhere where they say there's 12 degrees of freedom? No. Well, they should. There's 12 degrees of freedom. Uh, I'm sure they say it's somewhere. I don't know where. But anyways. So let's, I mean, I just gave you the formula for the degrees of freedom, there's 12. So we go to the 12th row. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look for our chi-squared value. Our chi-squared value here was 193.57. So let's go to 12 degrees of freedom and let's find where on this row we have 193.57. So do you see it? May I repeat that one more time, please? Sure. We've established that we have 12 degrees of freedom, correct? Yes. Okay. Our chi squared value as calculated is 193.57. So we'll find 193.57 in the row for 12 degrees of freedom. And you'll see the numbers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And bigger. It's way off the table and we already have a p-value of 0 0.01. So this thing certainly has a p-value less than 0 0.01. Would you agree? Yes. Okay. Which means the p-value is very, very, very small. What do we do? We reject the null hypothesis. What is the null hypothesis? That they are independent. And therefore we conclude that the data supports the fact that they are not independent. The data supports the fact that they are in fact dependent. This is the first example of the chi-square, <clears throat> testing for independence. Okay, so how do you do this on crunches? Ah, so how do you do this on crunches? That's a great question. What's a great question? Let's. Let's load up crunch it. And let's see how to do it on crunch it. So here's our data. Oh, let's go. Statistics. This is going to be um, this is going to be. Isn't it at the bottom of stats? Did I miss it? What do you see? Oh yeah, chi-squared. Thank you. I was looking for the symbol chi-squared. I wasn't looking for the word chi-squared. 
Okay, so the observed frequencies, those are the count column. And, but we don't have the expected, which means we'd have to put in our own data for expected, I think. Yeah, this is a different type of problem. A chi-squared goodness of fit is actually not what we want. We'll do in a second chi-squared goodness of fit. This is just a regular chi-squared, but I don't see it here. I don't see it. Oh, here we go, chi-squared. Degrees of free, uh, but that's just calculating it. That's not actually looking at data. So it looks like, it looks like we can't do it on this one. It looks like you'll have to do this one by hand or on this calculator, which is what I use. But I don't see a way of doing it on, yeah, it's not a goodness of fit test. That's the next thing that we're going to learn. Um, yeah. So you would have to come up with a whole nother column of data for the expected. And only then would you be able to use this. So yeah, so you're on your own for that one. Sorry, that's horrible for you. Um, but they're not going to make you do this number of calculations because that's just how do you want the calculator. So if you go to your calculator, okay, um, even on the calculator, you would still need to do the, you would still need to compute both data points. Even on the calculator, you would still need to compute both data points. Um, hold on. Even on the calculator, you would still need to do it. So you, so uh, where would it be? So if you go to stats and then you go to tests and you go down to the chi-squared tests, you would see something that looks like this, observed and then expected. And what you'd essentially be doing there is creating your L1 would be your observed, or actually you'd, you'd have to use matrices. Do you guys know what a matrix is? Probably not. So you know what, unfortunately for this one, if you know what a matrix is, that's great, but I think most people here probably don't. So um, in this example, in this example, um, um, isn't a matrix a two? It's a, a matrix of the two dimensional array. <laughs> a matrix is a two dimensional array. Um, if you know how to do it on that calculator, I don't want to spend time in class doing it because not everyone knows. But if you go to second matrix, what you need to do is edit and create a five by four matrix as follows math. Sorry, matrix edit. Basically, what you'd be doing is you'd be creating a five by four matrix putting in all of the expected and then creating a new five by four matrix, putting in all the observed and then having your calculator do it. You're not going to need to go through all these calculations on the test because that's just too much work for no reason. Okay. Um, there's no need for it and you don't have to worry about it. Okay. You just have to understand how to interpret the chi squared results. And this is the idea. You got to know how to calculate the number of degrees of freedom. R minus one times C minus one. If you have the chi-squared value, okay, and you should know the formula for it, you're not gonna have that many cells, 20 numbers to add. You're not gonna have that situation. We're not giving you busy work, okay? You might have two rows and three columns or something like that. So you'll have six cells, not too much, something small like that. You should know how to compute the chi-squared value. And then you should know how to use the table to determine whether or not the chi-squared value gives you one result or the other. No, it'll be in the final, 100%. But, but in terms of having to go through all these calculations, that you don't have to worry about in the final. That one you shouldn't expect to have to do because that's just busy work for no reason at all, okay? Um, the other situation for the chi-squared is a goodness of fit test. 
Okay, so the matrix is dependent on the rows versus columns and data sets. Yes, of course. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, so the other example is a goodness of fit test. So here's a situation. Never on Sunday, it says. It says births. Oh, what is that noise? I don't know how to turn it on. Okay, there. Births are not evenly distributed across days of the week. Fewer babies are born on Saturday and Sunday than on other days, probably because doctors uh, don't want to schedule births on weekends or hospitals don't want to schedule births on weekends because it's probably more expensive, okay? A random sample of 700 births from local records shows the following distribution. Every day of the week, these are the number of births that there were for this particular sample of 700. The question is, does this data give significant evidence that local births are not equally likely on all days of the week? That's the question, okay? Does the data support this fact or not? Now, if you look at Saturday and Sunday, what do you see about Saturday and Sunday in terms of their values? Are they in they're fact, lower the they're lower than everything else, right? The question is from a mathematical standpoint, are they lower enough for us to conclude that it's not the same across all days of the week. So what we do here is as follows. Our null hypothesis here is that all of the proportions, the amount for the first day of the week, the amount for the second day, the proportion for the second day of the week, the proportion for the third day of the week, all the way to the proportion for the last day of the week, the null hypothesis is that they are all the same. We are trying to see how well my data fits this model. Does my data support the model? Is it a good fit? Or does my data not support the model? Is it a bad fit? It's called a chi-squared goodness of fit test. We're trying to see how well the data fits a certain model. What is my null hypothesis? My null hypothesis is as usual that the, um, that the um, sorry, my alternative hypothesis is that the null hypothesis is wrong. How would I mathematically say in this case that the null hypothesis is wrong? What would be the mathematical way I would say that? The null hypothesis is not correct. How would I write that? Well, but there's seven things that are being equal according to, the null, uh, according to the null hypothesis, correct? So if the null hypothesis is not correct, if it's wrong, then well, how can I say that? Do I just say P1 is not equal to P2, is not equal to P3, is not equal to P4, is not equal to P5, all the way to not equal to P7? Would that be that the null hypothesis is wrong? And the answer is no. Maybe five of them are the same and two of them are different or three of them are the same, and these two are the same, and the last two are different. There's lots of ways a null hypothesis could be wrong that they're not all equal. So all I'm gonna say is not all equal. That's gonna be my alternative. That it's not true that they are all equal. That they're not all equal. That's really the best that I can do in this scenario. I can't do it mathematically. There's just too many possibilities of what it might be if they are not all equal. So I'm not gonna bother. I'm just gonna say not all equal. And the question is, how do I determine whether or not my null hypothesis or my alternative hypothesis is correct? So here's what I do. It's actually very, very straightforward. The chi-square test is one of the simplest um, procedures, both uh, uh, conceptual-wise and work-wise. First, how many births are there in total? that I'm looking at in my sample because they kind of tell me, so it's not a hard question. 700. 700. If the null hypothesis was really correct, how many should I have in each day? A hundred. So my expected for each one of these is 100. My, my observed are, of course, what I observed, but my expecteds are all going to be 100 in this case. Because if the null hypothesis is true, 
then they're all going to appear one seventh of the time. One seventh of 700 is uh, 100. So let's calculate our chi squared value. This is something that's more tractable for a test because it only has seven calculations. That's a horrible chi squared, but whatever. No, I can't in good conscience keep that. So hold on. Okay, so let's calculate our chi squared value. Take out your calculator. What is the first observed? 84. 84 minus the expected. What's the expected? 100. 100. We square that and then we divide by what? We square that and then we divide by what? Would it be 700? 100? No, we divide by the expected, which is 100. Not by the total. We divide by, remember, it's observed minus expected over expected. Oh, sorry, observed minus expected squared over expected. So 84 minus 100 squared over 100 is how much? 2.56. Plus, now we do the next one. What's the observed for the next one? 110. 110, what's the expected? 100. Observed minus expected squared over expected. What do we get? One. One. Because 110 minus 100 is 10, 10 squared is 100, 100 over 100 is one. Plus, now what's the next observed? 124. 124, what's the next expected? Still 100. So 100, so observed minus expected is how much? 24. What's observed minus expected in this case? 24. 24, which we then square and divide by expected. What do I get? 5.76. 5.76. And then we do the next one, the fourth one. What's my observed for the fourth one? 104. 104, what's my expected? 100. 104 minus 100 is how much? Four. Divided by a uh, square it and then divide by 100, what do I get? 0. 0.16. 0. 0.16. Then we do the next one. What's my observed? 94. 94, what's my expected? 100. So, Take the difference, square it, divide by 100. What do I get? 0. 0.36. 0.36. <clears throat> Next one. One point four four. One point four four, And last one. 7.6. 7.84. So what is my total chi-squared value in this example? 19.12. The question is, once again, is my chi-squared value large enough for me to reject the null hypothesis? Or is it not large enough? Now, remember what the null hypothesis is. The null hypothesis is that there's a certain relationship between all of my proportions. And the alternative hypothesis is that th that relationship is not true. Well, before I can do that, I must calculate the number of degrees of freedom. And this one goes back to the t-test. It's just number of data points minus one. How many data points are there in this problem? Seven. So how many degrees of freedom do I have? Six. Six. So I have my chi squared value. I have my degrees of freedom. <clears throat> so where are we here? Less than 0 0.01. Well, let's take a look. Here's six degrees of freedom and 19.12 is yep less than 0 0.01 so what is my conclusion
<clears throat> what is my conclusion? Can you go back to the question? Sure. <clears throat> that fewer babies uh, are are not born on Saturdays and Sundays than on, on other days of the week. Okay, well that might be your that might be your contextual conclusion. But the truth of the matter is, the best you can really say is that the null hypothesis is rejected. Correct. Yeah. In other words, it's not true that all seven days have the same proportion. Okay. The fact that I might have a follow up to that and say, and therefore Saturday and Sunday is less, technically requires a little more testing, which we're not going to learn because it's a little more complicated. Because once you say the null hypothesis is wrong and you say that, that the values are not all the same, the natural follow up question is okay, then what are they? Are any of them the same? Which ones are different? And those questions are just beyond the level of this course, so we're not going to worry about it. OK, so in this course, why is the expected value 100? Because there's 700 babies. And if the null hypothesis is true that all proportions are equal, it should be evenly spread out at 100 a day. No, the alternative, well, again, the alternative hypothesis is that the null hypothesis is not correct. The null hypothesis says all the proportions are the same, i.e. they should all be 100. So the alternative is that they're not all going to be 100. But as to what they are, we can't say. There's so many options. There's so many possibilities. So the best you say is that they're not all 100, i.e. they're not all equal. That's, that's really all you can do, okay? Um, yeah, some can be 100. I can have uh, five of them be 100 and two of them not be 100, and the, and the, the null hypothesis will be wrong, right? There's lots of options there. This test just tells me whether or not I can either reject or not reject the null hypothesis and does not give a follow-up. And that is it for the chi-square. Those are the only two situations that you have to worry about. A two-way categorical table where you're testing for independence, or a goodness of fit test where you're just trying to see whether or not the data fits a certain model. They both have the same basic idea. You calculate the chi-squared value, which comes from this formula. And once you have that, you then go ahead and um, look at your chart and determine where the chi-squared value falls with degrees of freedom and determine what the p-value is and then decide whether or not you're going to uh, uh, reject or not reject the null hypothesis. Does that make sense so far? Are there questions on that? Because I really want to make sure we cover that because that's you know the last chapter and whatnot. Uh, and I thought we had done it, you know, and I, I say I was wrong, but we just did it now. What I want to do now is immediately start the review. So if you go to your your uh, homework assignments. Or you go to your, uh, um, let me start sharing again. I'm sorry. I, uh, hold on. If you go to your uh, sapling, you will see here under exams and review, review for final exam part one, review for final exam part two, review for final exam part three. Let's open up everyone, review for final exam part one. And start reviewing. I did see a chat question. Um, how do I load up the chat? Um, so someone says for the chi-square, we are basically looking at a table to either accept or reject the null hypothesis um, or finding the, the degrees of freedom on the data when there's a question on the exam. Yeah, um, when it comes to the exam, you're basically <clears throat> either going to be computing the chi-square value if the um, if the if the table is small, I would say don't expect more than ten at the most. Uh, determining the degrees of freedom, r minus one, c minus one, or just data points minus one. <clears throat> most importantly, 
on looking at your data and comparing it to a table to determine the p-value and determining whether or not you should accept or reject the null hypothesis. You don't think you have, you don't have that guys? Is it not there? I might have to, I might have to share it. Maybe it's not there yet, hold on. Uh, do I have to share it? Show. Okay, I'm now showing it. I'm not sure if it was already being shown. I'm gonna show the review pile part two and I'm gonna show the review part three. Do you guys see them now? Yes. <clears throat> okay, so let's load up the first one, which is review for final exam part one. Okay, we're not gonna get to the whole thing. It's 43 questions, um, but let's start. Okay. Um, now, one way for me to do, us to do this, a review was posted on, uh, yeah, I posted that review as well. I posted it right before class, but that is also not a review for the entire course. That's only a review for um, the first five or six chapters. And it's like 112 questions. So we're, we're, we're certainly not finish it, but hey, the more you do, the better. Are we doing it together? That's the plan. The plan is to, um, is to start and to get as much as we can done together. And then hopefully you guys do the rest on your own. So go ahead and read this, please. No, I finished my turkey dinner. Am I sharing my screen? Can you guys see what I'm saying? No, let me share my screen. Okay. But hopefully you should just be loading it up yourself. It'll be easier. And that way you can actually do it yourself and see if you get the right answer. In fact, let's do that. Can you guys put in an answer yourself? Are we getting points for this assignment? Only if you do well, how's that? Right, this is meant to be a review. Can you guys enter data? Like enter answers? Or is it just um, just reading the questions? Anyone? Bueller? Someone? I can't put any I can I can't do anything here. Answer blank. Oh wait, is it the answer? Oh, that's the answer. Oops. Wow, okay, that was horrible. Okay, go ahead and do it. I'll give you a minute or two. Go ahead and do it. Did anyone get it wrong? I don't know how to do this in the most expeditious manner. Um, if I just give the answer straight up, we'll obviously do more questions, but then you don't do them yourself. So I'll give you a minute or two and then I'll just, I'll just do it. So in this case, the question is, what are the individuals? Okay, so what we have here are the make and models are these four. The vehicle class, transmission type, number of cylinders, city MPG, highway MPG, annual food fuel cost. Um, and so the question first is, what are the individuals in the data sets? So the individuals are the first column. These are the makes and models. They are the sub Subaru in whatever. They are the Nissan, Hyundai, and Chevrolet. Nissan. Hyundai and Chevrolet. Those are the individuals. Then we have different types of variables, categorical and quantitative. The vehicle class, is that categorical or is that quantitative? This is the very first thing we learned this semester. Vehicle class, 
Categorical or quantitative? Categorical. Categorical. So that's vehicle class. Next, transmission type, categorical or quantitative? Categorical. Categorical. Next, number of cylinders, categorical or quantitative? Quantitative. Quantitative. City MPG. Quantitative. Quantitative. Highway MPG. Quantitative. Annual fuel cost. Quantitative. Um, so what else do we have here? Automatic and manual are the types of transmission types, but those are not the variables themselves. Mid-size, compact, large. Again, those are types as well as small station wagons. So these guys should be, oh, specific variable value. There we go. A specific variable value. So a small station wagon is a type of categorical variable. It is a specific one. Large, mid-size, compact, large, mid-size, compact. These are all specific values. Manual, automatic. Those are all specific, very, now they're not really values. I'm not sure what they're, I don't, I don't like the word value because it's not numerical, but let's see whether or not we like, they like our answer or they hate it. How do I check? Check answer. Well, what, does that mean it's correct? Oh yeah, that's a solution. All right, yeah. So here's a solution. Does that make sense for the first one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Next one. Which statement best character? Oh, come on, they go directly to solution every time? No, okay, what? Okay. Which statement best characterizes the definition of categorical and quantitative? So even though you might know the answer because you saw mine, actually read all four to decide. So which one is it? It does let me select on the screen an answer, so good. So go ahead and do that. You should always do it before I do. So it says quantitative data consists of numbers, whereas categorical data consists of names and labels that are not numeric. We know this is not correct. I gave an example of something like zip codes, which is numeric, but it's not quantitative. Remember that? It's gotta be a measurement or a count, correct? Remember we did that one? Guys, anything? Yeah. Okay. So the solution. Yes, sir. Okay. So let's go to the next one. Come on. Why does it go to the solution right away? I don't get why it does that. What is? Oh, every time. Okay. Suppose that a polling company surveyed 600 people about how much time they spend exercising each week. The results of the survey were compiled and used to create this relative frequency histogram. What percentage of respondents said they exercise less than three hours per week? Anyone? I'm doing the other, okay, so what do you guys wanna do? Do you guys wanna do this on your own? And then next time in class, I just go over the ones that people have questions on? Would you rather do that? I'm just not able to load up the the screen like you know how you could see the question 
No. My on my sapling, it's not letting me, so that's why I don't think I can do it right now. I think there's technical issues, not for sure, but I don't know what everyone else thinks. Um, I'm not sure. I, are people being able to do it? But how do you solve this one? Well, you just add up all the columns. The first one is 22 percent, 26 percent, 19 percent. You add them all together. What do you get? Do I still need to share my screen or are you all looking at your own? The first was 23. Now the first is certainly 22. Each tick mark is 2%. Are we not all seeing the same thing? Oh, some of the questions have different numbers. Oh, so your, yours might not be the same as mine. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to stop recording.